to see you. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I... Thank you. Wow. That was really good. That they was like nice. Us. They like us. Well, hey, if you don't know who we are, uh, we're the pastors here at Elevation, and we've been on an eight-week sabbatical. And so my name's Daniel, and this is my wife, Gretchen. Would you like to say hi? Hi. <laughs> that got weird. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, we just wanted to take just a moment to introduce ourselves, and we're excited to share just what God has put in our heart. Um, but before I get to the message, I wanted to share just real quick, uh, before we left, um, I failed to mention something, and, and so I wanted to make sure I circled back around, um, and that was, and you may have received an email this week that talked about the legacy offering, and so before we left, we received an offering um, in May, and it was a, you know, kind of a one-time offering to go towards future opportunities, and so kind of like, you know, a young couple might put away money to buy a house someday, that's kind of what we were doing, we leased this space, and so we were putting money away to someday uh, be able to purchase something uh, on behalf of the church. And so uh, the email said that we brought in 18000 but I wanted to make sure you knew that it was actually more than that. It was almost $25,000. Oh, praise Jesus. And, and so we awesome. just praise God for that. We praise God for the fact that, one, he is so generous to us. And also what I love about this church is that our church is grabbing hold of that revelation. And it's demonstrated in our generosity. And so I just want to say thank you for contributing to that and being a part of that. And you can continue to do that as we continue to look to what's next for our church. But I just want to say thank you uh, for being a part of that. Um, I also want to just mention um, really quick, as we were singing, I was just reminded of just how important it is that we live in God's presence I mean, yeah, guys, yeah, we yeah. need his presence more and more. Yeah. And as we sang that song, um, Is It Not Enough? Is that the song's title? Is that right? Am I with it? Yeah. See, I, I can't even get that right. <laughs> that song, Nothing Else by Cody Carnes, it's just, it's such a powerful song. And it really does take you into that place. And you may not even know, but there was a spontaneous moment in the middle of that song that we didn't even plan for. That God just kind of moved in. Yeah, yeah, and what yeah. I want to say to you is I wrote a book recently called The Pursuit of Presence. And the reason I highlight this is not because of me, but I highlight it because I wrote this book because one of the things I'm desperate for, yeah, yeah. one of the things that keeps me in the game yeah. is God's presence. Yeah, yeah. And so if you don't know anything about that or you want to grab hold of some of that, Please go out in the lobby. We have a free copy for you to be able to start your journey of spending time connected to the source of your life. And so just grab hold of that. I just want to encourage that for and you. And I suspect there are some of you who have received that free book but have not read it. And um, I just want to let you know it's, it's pretty good. And I would, uh, I would recommend it as a good use of your time. So. Yeah, right? And, and you may not know this, but in publishing, one of the things that they say is that you got to have a good cover. Like, if you don't have a good cover, people won't buy it. And so it's really the cover that sells the book. Most people buy books they never read, and they only buy it because they like the cover. And so, so here's what I'm saying. It's a great cover. <laughs> but the content's even better. So go ahead and grab that so that you can just be blessed by it, okay? Yeah. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much for just this time to be back yes. standing on this platform. Yes, Jesus. In this house. Yeah. We are nourished by this community. Mm. And it's so good to be home. Yeah. Father, we ask that as we open your word, we ask that you would impart revelation, mm. fresh bread for each of us here today. Wherever we have need, Holy Spirit, would you speak? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles up to Proverbs chapter 16. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We can get you one, or you can follow along on the screens. But we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 16, and I want to look at verse 9 in just a second. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. I titled this message, or I should say, we titled this message. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> listen, listen. 
plans change. Now, if you know our story over the last eight weeks, you know that plans change. (laughs) Things that we were not intending, things that we didn't anticipate. And I suspect that all of us at various times in our life have had plans that have changed. Yes? Listen to these words from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. I'm reading now the Amplified Version, but listen to this. A man's mind plans his way. A woman's mind plans her way as he or she journeys through life. So the Bible is saying very clearly that we make our plans, right? We have plans. We all make plans. It's important. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's good to plan. It's not bad. The Bible says that you're foolish if you don't plan. So there's this, this instruction from the Lord that planning is important. Planning is a good thing. Having strategy is a good thing. But, see, this is, I call this the big but of Scripture. But, creating a contrast, right? But, the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. So in other words, we make plans. The Bible encourages us to make plans. But we have to remember the but. We have to remember that in the middle of all of our planning, there's a but. And the but is that the Lord directs our steps. The Lord establishes our steps. Come on. So, So this is important to see. Because what the Bible is talking about here is not just our plans, though important. The Bible is contrasting our plans with something that the Bible teaches that is so significant that we should understand. And that is the sovereignty of God. Now that is a big word with all kinds of horsepower behind it. Let me read this to you. It's a definition of the word sovereignty. You're like, like, I think I know what this is. You might think about it in relationships to kings and queens and kingdoms. The sovereign one, yes, has entered the room. (laughs) Over their domain, yes, kind of you have the idea. But listen to this. This This is a biblical definition of sovereignty. Stay with me. Sovereignty, the fact that God is free and able to do all that he wills. (laughs) <laughs> He's free and able to do all that he wills, that he reigns over all creation, not just a little kingdom, but the kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He reigns over all creation, and that his will is the final cause of all things. Yeah, yeah. Whoo! Man, that is beefy, isn't it? You can chew on that for a while. That's not like drinking milk. It's that sovereignty of God. See, that's what Proverbs is trying to show us. Proverbs is trying to show us is that we make plans all the time. But we have to recognize that in the middle of all of our plans, God is still sovereign. And what's crazy about this is that they're not really, it's kind of interesting that that this particular passage uses the word but. Because it is contrasting it, but it's not necessarily saying that they're diametrically opposed to each other. Matter of fact, it's asserting that both truths are true at the same time. In other words, that God is not saying that you don't have free will. That you don't make plans and you shouldn't make plans. But he's saying in the middle of you having free will, you have to remember that God is sovereign over all the paths. He is sovereign over everything in your life, always and forever. And he doesn't change. He's not upset. He doesn't kind of have a bad day. He doesn't get tired. He's always stable established, purposeful. Oh, don't we need that? In a world that's up and down, in our lives that seem so up and down, our emotions grab hold of us. Oh, we need that. And so this idea of sovereignty, contrasting our planning is so important for us to see. And so here's what I want to say to you today. 
Gretchen and I had plans. We had plans for a sabbatical. Oh, we had plans. We wanted to go and do all the things. Lay on beaches, fish. I was going to go to Ninkling, remember? Where were you going? I was going to do to Ninkling. Oh, yeah, to Ninkling. But I, I did not. There was no to Ninkling. We had plans. I still don't even really know what it is. It's, you throw stuff. No. No. Moving on. We had plans, and they were good plans. But on that Tuesday morning, when we got the phone call, the call that we didn't anticipate, you ever had one of those? You ever had something show up on your doorstep that you didn't plan for? Probably the hardest phone call we've ever got. 4.30 in the morning, I think, our time. Nurse calls us and tells us that our sister, Gretchen's sister, my sister-in-law, Sarah, uh, had had a procedure done. We knew she was having the procedure. We were praying for that procedure. She was out of the procedure in ICU, working through that. That's where they put her. It was good. And then in the middle of that, she went into cardiac arrest from a pulmonary embolism, and that led to her brain not getting the oxygen that it needed and multiple strokes after that. And the phone call we got was, you need to get to the hospital. It's not good. You know, when a nurse calls you and tells you to get to the hospital, that's not good. The problem was that we were in Orlando when we got that phone call. I've never heard my wife scream like that in my life. And quite frankly, I never want to hear that again. Hard, hard day. Hard few hours trying to get from a hotel to an airplane, an airplane back to St. Louis so that we could maybe get back to the hospital that Sarah was in, hoping and praying and, and longing for God to move in space and time on our behalf. Because one of the things that the doctor said on that phone call that I was having is that he said, Sarah wasn't going to make it. Now, I don't know if you've ever had anybody tell you that over the phone, that somebody you love is not going to make it. It was one of the scariest, hardest things we've ever been through in our lives. We had plans, you know, and we wanted those plans to come true, just like anybody would. But those plans changed. And I don't know if you've ever had these moments in your life where plans changed or things got really dark really quickly. Maybe you've, you've wondered where God was. Come on. You've wondered where the Lord was in all of those things. It's kind of like in Isaiah chapter 40 uh, that we know that we're always going to go through suffering. In this life, we will suffer. In this life, we'll go through difficult things. And oftentimes, we have these questions. Let me read to you the questions that Isaiah writes that we can all relate to. Listen to these questions. He says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Have you ever felt like God disregarded you? You ever felt... <laughs> Like God was not listening? You ever felt like God was hiding from you? Come on. If we're honest, you ever been in a situation that you were up to here and you didn't know? Yeah. That you were so, it was hidden from you and you wondered where God was and you were crying out to God and you were saying, God, where are you? Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what's happening in Isaiah. He's, he's, he's helping us see that we often ask this question. Matter of fact, if you look at the original language, it says, why do you continually say? In other words, it's become a habit in our lives often where we say to God, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And it's just this habit. Yeah. Yeah. And we're continually saying to God, where are you? And it, look, 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 it's okay. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask God where he is. It's okay, matter of fact, if you missed the sermons from Pastor JT, 
Go back and listen to them. They're on biblical lamenting. See, biblical lamenting is important for us as Christians to understand how to do. Because, see, we have to be able to go to God with our sorrowful lament and say, God, where are you? I need you. He's not mad at us for doing that. Matter of fact, he's happy and proud that you're doing it because that means you're coming towards him. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. In your pain, in your suffering, and you're searching for the answer. Yeah. And guess who has it? It's God. And so he's not mad at us, but he's trying to get us to see that you don't have to stay in a continual place of questioning who God is and what God is up to. And he goes on and he says this in verse 28. I love this. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Do you not know? And have you not heard? And he's about to remind us, okay? He's about to remind us. But what he's doing is he's setting us up with two questions. Do you not know? And have you not heard? And the original language there is this word halo. Some of you are thinking about Beyonce right now. (laughs) Halo. But see, this word halo means, and it's so good, you have to see this, should know the answer. So the questions are really not saying, hey, let me question you, as much as what he's saying is making a statement of saying, you should know the answer to this. Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you should know the answer to this. And so what he's trying to get us to see is that there is an answer And there's an answer that we've all got to grab hold of because what happens sometimes is when you're in pain or when you're suffering or when your plans change, you don't know where God is. You don't know what God's up to. And what Isaiah is trying to get us to see is that God is always up to something. God is always working. God is not uh, sitting there wondering what's going on, but he can do something about the situation. Yes. Right. Right. Listen, we should know the answer. And this is what's so good. He's, he's not mad at us. He doesn't be like, well, because you don't know the answers, you bunch of dummies, get out. <laughs> he doesn't do that at all. You know what he does? He reminds us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The Bible's full of reminders. Yeah. Over and over again, we're told to remember what God has done. Yeah. And he says this, the reminder. And I'll let you get, I'll get, let you get in on this in just a second, baby. <laughs> I'm going to preach for a little bit. I'll just sit here and wave. She's doing really good, isn't she? (laughs) Here's the reminder. Listen. He says, the Lord is the everlasting God. That's good news. The fact that God is everlasting is good news, friends. He says, the creator creator of the ends of the earth. So he's everlasting. He's the creator. Then watch this. He says, he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. God doesn't get tired. His knowledge is way far beyond ours, even though sometimes we think we're real smart and we make all kinds of plans. And then watch this. In verse 29, it says, he gives strength. Are you weary today? He gives strength. He gives strength to you. See, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Uh, even youths, the youths. Isn't that how you say that in New York or something? The youths. Is that right? Just move on. The youths. <laughs> even the youths grow weary. Even the youth grow weary. So all you youths in here, the Bible says that you grow weary too. Yeah. Even if you're young, you still get weary. Even if you're young, you still get tired. You get burnt out. You get, you know, he says, even the youth grow tired and weary. And young men, young women stumble and fall. And then watch this in verse 31. This is where it's good. Here's another but. But those who hope in the Lord, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will. Come on, this is on your wall somewhere. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk, come on, and not grow faint. You need that today, don't you? You need a little pep in your step. You need a little Holy Ghost power to help you get through the day. (laughs) 
isn't that good? He reminds them. He's like, look, I know you keep asking the same question. And you should know this by now. But if you don't remember, this is who the God is that yeah. we serve. Yeah. In the middle of all of it, in the middle of the suffering, in the middle of the brokenness. See, when we suffer, here are some truths that you can hold on to. Listen, God is not hiding. He's not hiding from you. He's not playing hide and seek with you in your pain. He is not some sadistic theos out there in some world or universe. He's close. He's imminent. He's not hiding And we are not disregarded by God. God never disregards us. He loves us. He would never disregard us. How about this? God is everlasting. You know what that means? You can always count on him. He's always true. Always going to be there. So good. We can count on him. How about this one? God is creator. You know what that means? It means you're purposed. You're not an accident, regardless of what science can tell you. You are not an accident. You were purposed by God. The Bible says that you were knitted by God in your mother's womb. He knows the hairs on your head. And so that means you're purposed. And that is a good news, friends. When you're going through it, it's good to know that you're purposed. It's good to know. See, God is a giver. You know what he gives? Everything. In this passage, it says he gives you strength. And see, what's happening is in your weakness, he's saying, hey, why don't you trade your weakness in for my strength? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you stop yeah. depending on your strength and trade it in and get my strength? Yeah. And watch your weakness become strength. Yeah. See, that's what he's given us in this passage, but he gives us so much more in every other passage. And that's why it's so important, church, that, listen, listen, that we become generous. Yeah. Because he's generous. He taught us to be givers. And some of us are robbing God today because we don't give him the tithe. And I'm just going to be plain with you because I've, people, I love you. you. (laughs) This situation with Sarah has created urgency in my heart. I don't know know how long I have in this world, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you what I know. And we serve a God who's generous, and he wants his people to be generous. Yeah. Yeah. And you will yeah. experience the blessings of God when you do. Yeah. I'll share this story with you really quick. It's a great story. Uh, I was in a prayer service, and, and God prompted me to give $5,000 from our church to another church who was moving from being portable to being established. And so they were in a campaign to try and raise enough money to go into a more permanent location. And I felt like God told me to give them $5,000. So as a church, we gave them $5,000. Now, that's seed sowing, right? We're sowing seed into that ministry. And that's what God calls us to do. I had no idea what God would do that. And while we were on our sabbatical, it was crazy. I get a text from somebody. And that person texts me and says, hey, I'd like to give the church $25,000. Guys, that's five times the seed. Yeah, yeah. That's five times the seed. Yeah. That's what God does. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you're nervous, if you're afraid, if you're scared, if whatever it is, sow a seed. Yeah. Yeah. Put your faith into action and watch what God will do. I didn't anticipate 25 grand showing up, yeah. but I guarantee you God did that. Right. Because, see, when we're faithful to God, God does what he says he'll do, too. See, we don't give to God to get. We give to God because we love him. And what's so cool about being in a relationship with God is he loves to shower his gifts on his kids. And he wants to do the same for you. See, God God is not tired. You know what that means? That we can always call. You're never interrupting him. Get on the dial. God, I need you. Right now, I don't know what to do. Father, I don't know what to do in this situation. Would you help me? How about this one? God is all-knowing. You know what that means? You can ask him. You can ask him anything. He knows. If you don't know, he knows. You might be in a job right now that you can't figure out. Well, say, God, I need your help. I can't figure out this job. Can you help me? And he'll give you the knowledge you need. I believe it. He'll help you. And some of you are like, I don't know if that's true. Press in and see if it's true. Ask and see if God doesn't show up. I'm preaching better than they're responding, I think, sweetie. It's true. 
Thank you. <laughs> See, we all suffer and we all grow weary, even the youth, it says. But here's the promise. There's a lot in that verse, uh, the promises of God. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. There hasn't been many seasons or any seasons in my life where I needed strength like the last month and a half. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. See, the first phone call that we got said that Sarah's routine procedure had gone bad and that she was in trouble, that they had gotten her pulse back, but she was critical and we needed to get there. And the second phone call that we got said she wasn't going to make it. It was the doctor saying that they had done everything they could and Sarah wasn't going to make it. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. But Sarah did make it because God is bigger than even the best doctor St. Louis has to offer. Our God is bigger. And when you get a phone call that says there's no hope, God says, there sure is, because I'm bigger, and you can hope in me. And that verse became such a huge, huge encouragement to me. Because you see, after they got her back, then they hook her up to every machine under the sun. Yes. And then she's not breathing on her own. Yes. And hospitals are about waiting See, other translations of that verse say those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And it becomes all about waiting. Yeah. Waiting for her to breathe. Waiting for her to open her eye. Waiting for her to talk to you. Waiting for a doctor to tell you it's going to be okay. You wait, you wait, you wait. And I read that verse from Isaiah over and over and over again. Those that wait in the Lord will renew their strength. And then one day I read it in the Amplified Version and it says this. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him will gain new strength. Who expect, look for, and hope in him will gain new strength. You see, we define waiting as just the passing of time. Right. Just sitting in a hospital room waiting for a doctor to come in. But that's not what scripture says. Right. It says as believers, our waiting is active. Yeah. That as believers, when we wait on the Lord, we're expecting God to move. That we get on a plane with horrible news expecting God to do something. Because the Bible says we can. That we can expect God to move. And in the next 31 days in the hospital, doctors said a whole lot of things. They said that Sarah might never wake up. And she did. They said that Sarah might not breathe on her own. And she did. They said that Sarah's brain might be damaged beyond repair, and it is not. They kept saying, this is what is, and our God kept saying, no, this is who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Because, see, those that wait on the Lord, we expect God to move. That's right. That's right. We expect God to move. And one day I had a conversation with a neurologist, one of the greatest doctors I've ever been blessed to know. And this neurologist showed me a picture of Sarah's brain. And this neurologist kept saying, what you see here is death. What you see here is brain death. What you see here is. And the Lord spoke to me in that moment and said, you are not a person that lives by what you see. You are a person that lives by faith. And even in the few short weeks since talking to that doctor who showed me a picture of what is supposed to be, none of what he said is true. Because we expect God to move. And then this verse says that we look for God. 
We look for him in the midst of our darkest days. We look for him because I think most of the time we miss what God is doing. We wait for this huge outcome that we want so badly and we miss all the things that God does every second of the day on our behalf. We miss little things because we're not looking for them. And the Bible says that when we wait, we look for God. And in the last eight weeks, I have seen God in amazing ways. In huge ways, in little ways, in surprising ways. And I hope that someday I am able to share with you all of the things that God did when we looked for him to move. See, God doesn't want these horrible things to happen to us. That's not always his plan. But he says, I will use it for good. I will take what the enemy wanted to destroy and use it for good. And in our church, we have story after story of miracles in the years we've been around. And one of my favorites is Jesse Buckeye. And Jesse Buckeye was born way too soon. And the same experience, doctors saying, this is what he won't do. This is what might happen. And none of which happened. And God healed him. But in, when we were in the ICU, the ICU is a horrible place. It's awful. And you just wait for doctors to come in and tell you all of this stuff. And there's like a team of doctors, so it's every hour another one comes in and tells you this long list of what's not good. It is a hard place to be. And I remembered my dear friend, the Buckites, who spent weeks in the ICU with their baby boy. And I called my dear friend Amy and I said, how do you survive it? How do you get up every day and go into the ICU? And she left me a voicemail the next day that shared with me all that her and Nate had learned in those weeks that Jesse was in the ICU. And she said that her and Nate clung to a verse from Psalms because they knew they were going to go in and hear from doctors who would say a bunch of things, none of which came to pass in Jesse's life. Amen. Amen. And she said they would cling to this verse that said, the righteous will not fear a bad report. And because of what Nate and Amy went through, I got to listen to that voicemail for 31 straight days (laughs) when I walked into a hospital room that said, I will not fear a bad report. And I listened to doctor after doctor after doctor tell me things that are not true, that will not be true in Sarah's life because my God is bigger. That's right, that's right, that's right. We expect God to move. We look for where he's moving and we hope in the Lord. We hope in the Lord. Because God says, I will give you strength. And there were days where it didn't look like things were going to turn out the way we wanted. And God kept saying, regardless of the outcome, I will give you strength. Regardless of the outcome, I will give you strength. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And we need to be people who don't just sit around and do nothing, but that we expect God to move. We look for where he's moving and we hope in what God will do. Because a biblical hope is not the way we use hope in conversation. I hope I win the lottery. I hope I don't get stuck in traffic. I hope it stops raining. That's not how the Bible uses the word hope. The Bible uses the word hope as an assurance that our God will do what he says he will do. And an assurance of an eternity that no matter what Satan tries to do, we have an eternity in Jesus. And that hope gives us strength in our darkest days. In our darkest days. And I believe in a big God that can do amazing things. And I've seen God work in big ways, in small ways. He's given us laughter in the midst of awful situations. My sister does not like to speak in public. My sister likes to help faithfully behind the scenes. That's her deal. She hates speaking. Someday I hope God will give her the ability to share with you what he did in her life. But she doesn't like it. And when she was in high school, she was in mandatory speech class. The class you have to take. She hated it. She hated everything about it. And she had to do this, I can't say this word, expiraneous? Is that the word? Yeah. 
Ooh, you're a good extemporaneous speech where you couldn't prepare for it, right? And you had to draw a topic out of a bucket and then give this speech on it. And my sister, when she's 15 in high school, she draws a card that says blood. What, what are you gonna do? Seven minutes on blood, ready, go. And she gave this speech and it was not fantastic. Um, she talked about vampires and blood donation and how it stains your clothes. I mean, it was not real cohesive, it was not a thing. And then at the end, she remembers that you have to have a good conclusion, you know, of your speech for your grade. And so Sarah says, in conclusion, just hold on to your blood. <laughs> and so for years, my family has laughed at this idea that in conclusion, you just hold on to your blood. We say it all the time. And you see, Sarah's blood turned on her in June. She started to get anemic. She got these blood clots that got in all parts of her body and caught all kinds of havoc. And one day after Sarah had woken up, her brain started working again. In these horrible, horrible moments, she looks at me and says, I guess I was right. You need to hold on to your blood. <laughs> and I laughed so hard in that hospital room. And see, I believe in a God that is big enough and strong enough and wise enough to know that 25 years after she's 15, her blood's gonna turn on her. And that when she reaches in a bucket, maybe just maybe God has her pick a card that says blood. So in our darkest days, we can laugh about it. And I don't know if that's what happened. I don't know if that's what God did, but I know it could have. Because that's who my God is. And I will expect him to move. I will look for him to move. And I will hope in who God is. That's like good. For some of you, some of you championship wrestlers, I just tagged her out and I came in. You see what just did there? <laughs> Guys, I just want to say this. That wasn't easy what she did, what she just did. You know, it's all very raw and real right now, guys. And I am so proud of you for sharing that because I know that wasn't easy. And li now listen, she did that because she loves you. She did that because she wants you to receive that revelation. Because someday, if you're not already there, you will suffer. You will go through hard things. And you need to know, have a shadow of a doubt, that God is who he says he is because that's what you can hold on to. That's what you can grab hold of. And I, I was reminded of this in between services. Chris reminded me of this, and it was so good. Uh, we had a prayer service for Sarah uh, to intercede on behalf of God that he would save her life. And we cried out to the Lord in that service. And, and um, <laughs> one of the things that um, was said at that service, Ben's wife, Linda, uh, Linda got up. And she began to pray, and she said, I want everybody in here to imagine for a moment with the expectation that Sarah would walk in this building. That's what she said. Let me tell you who's sitting right there. That's Sarah, everybody. She walked in this building today. Don't tell me that miracles don't happen. That when God's people reach for a God that loves them, that miracles can happen. And I believe, and I believe in all, with everything in me, that those things are possible. And you can sit here and we can have debates about whether or not God is real. You ask Sarah if God's real. We know without a shadow of a doubt that God reached into space and time and saved her life when the doctor said she was gone. God said not yet. God said not yet. Woo! I'm about to run around this stage. God help me. You know, in the weeks 
uh, since Sarah has started to get better. I've had people continually say to me, that must be the biggest miracle you've ever experienced in your life. And in this very sweet moment with the Lord, he said, I reminded that, was reminded that, no, it wasn't. Huh. As huge as that was, that isn't the biggest miracle in my life. Yeah. The biggest miracle in my life is that there's a God that loves me. That there is a God that has saved me. And that there is a God that has promised me an eternity in heaven. So good. And I will live every day in the awe of that miracle, Mm -hmm. expecting more miracles to come. That's so good. So good. So good. And so here's the deal. The Bible says if you'll hope in the Lord, that he'll renew your strength. That's a promise. That's a promise. And that means that if you will reach for him, he will do what he says. If you're weary today, you reach for a God who's strong. You begin to reach for the God that you can count on. You will begin to to soar, the Bible says. You'll begin to run and not grow weary. You, you, You will begin to walk and not be faint. You know what I'm believing for Sarah today? I'm believing that she's going to be able to run. Yeah, she's going to be able to run. And she's not going to get weary. I believe that, that when she walks, she's not going to grow faint. Yeah. Because, see, the yeah. Bible says it's possible. Yeah. And so I'm just going to continue to believe God and let everybody else believe whatever they want. But I'm going to continue to believe what God yeah. has said. Yeah. Because if he said it, he can do it. Right. And so I just want us to grab hold of this today. Because here's the thing. As we kind of come to an end, um, Gretchen and I, if we're really honest, we're kind of weary. It's been, it's been rough, you know? The last few weeks have been rough. You know, I, I think the way we would describe it is that we had about three weeks of sabbatical, and the, the remainder was just more like family medical leave. You know what I mean? But, but in the middle of all that, as we go through it, yeah, we're weary, we're tired. It's been hard. But here's something I want to share with you. In, in, in Judges 8, chapter 4, Judges 8, chapter 4, Uh, If you remember, Pastor Josh came and preached on Gideon. If you missed his sermon, Pastor Josh Earls, he pastors a church here in in our community, Faith Community Church. Um, But he preached a sermon on Gideon, and he talked. It was a fabulous sermon. You've got to watch it if you haven't seen it. But, But I wanted to share this. So this is in the story of Gideon in, in, in chapter 8, verse 4. Listen to this. Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him. Because remember, God cut his army down. The 300 men who were with Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over. Listen to this. Were weary yet pursuing. I want that to just sit with you for a second. Weary yet pursuing. See what I'm getting at? See, we're all going to get weary. We're all going to get tired. We're all going to run out of energy. But what's so amazing is that we serve a God who doesn't. And what happens sometimes in our weariness is what we do is we sit down and we don't reach for the one that can help us. Some of you today, right now, have sat down and you're not reaching anymore. You're just not reaching. Now, it doesn't mean you're bad. It just means that you're weary and you're worn out and you're tired. But what I'm saying to you today and what Gretchen and I are saying to you today, if you would simply recognize that you're weary, but begin to pursue. Whatever you've got in you, begin to reach for the God that can help you. Begin to pursue. So you may be weary, yet pursuing. You may be weary, keep pursuing. You may be tired, but keep reaching. You may not want to just keep doing it. I don't care. Whatever you've got to do to grab hold of the one that can help you. Because so often in our lives, we stop reaching and we wonder why this is happening. Why I can't get better. And it's because we're relying on our own strength. And God is just saying, hey, at the end of you is me. At the end of you is me. And would you just simply reach for me and you will find me. And so here's the thing I want to ask you today. Are you weary? Maybe at some point in your life with God, you sat down. You know, it got too hard. And you just said, you know what, I'm done. I've asked too many questions and it feels like you're not answering. I'm just, I just can't. 
It is God's grace that you're in this room today. It is God's grace that I'm asking you this question, are you weary? Because the Bible says if we will continue to pursue, he will meet us there. And I'm asking you today, if you are weary, would you reach for the one that can help you? Would you just start to pursue? Would you just begin to reach for him? Because I promise you, he'll meet you in that. And so what Gretchen and I want to do is we want to be able to pray for you in just a moment. But I want to remind you of something that Pastor Josh said in that sermon that just, it just, it was such a good sermon. You got to check it out. But one of the things he said is that if God is the God of the victory, he's also the God of the battle. Come on. So, so, so God is the God, not if, God is the God of the victory. And that means he is also the God of the battle. And so whatever you're battling, whatever you're going through, the victory's coming because the Bible promises it. But in the middle of the battle, he's there too. And you can reach for him and you can pursue him and you can find the strength you need to make it through that situation. We believe in God, a God that can do miracles. And my hope and prayer is that you would too. And if you don't believe, just look at Sarah. It's right there. He'll do the same thing in your life. I believe it 100%. I'd like to pray for you. Let's Gretchen and I pray for you guys. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the miracle. Yes. We thank you for Sarah. We thank you for Jesse. We thank you for all the things that you've done. We, we just see it happening all over the place. And we're just grateful. Lord, we long for more miracles. Yes. We long for more miracles in our midst. But like Gretchen said, the greatest miracle ever is that you loved us. Yes, Jesus. (laughs) That you sent your son to die for us. Hmm. You know, just for a moment, we want to pray for those in here that are weary. Yes, Jesus. I'm just so glad you're here. Hmm. Thank you, Father. It is always better to be weary in God's house than not. Yes, Jesus. And I'm just grateful that you're here. And so what I want you to do, if you're you're just weary, I want you to physically, like, grab hold of that weariness. Just physically grab hold of it. And I want you to offer it to the Lord. Like, as an offering, just offer it to the Lord physically. Just, just, Just remove it from your body and just offer it to the Lord. And say, God, I give you this weariness. Would you... Would you take it? And in your mind's eye, in your spirit, just picture him placing his strength in your hand. And as he does, pull his strength to you. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. Just receive that. Make the great exchange. Your weariness for his strength. I know that there are some in this room that have walked away from God. Maybe you sat down a long time ago and you stopped reaching. I just want you to know that God purposed for this moment to, to, to once again remind you that he loves you. That you can run, but you can't hide. Perhaps you need to come back to him today. Perhaps you need to say, you know, God, I'm sorry. I've I've ran. I've sat down. I've stopped reaching. I need you. Just say that to him. Say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Would you forgive me for running? Would you forgive me for stop, for stop reaching, for stop reaching for you? God, would you forgive me? I'm sorry. Would you come in? Would you renew me? Would you refresh me? Would you give me everything that I need? Just say that to me. The greatest miracle of all is Jesus. The one thing that makes Christianity unique and significant is the resurrection of Jesus. It's, It's what makes us different. Jesus beat death. He was killed 
on a brutal, a brutal death. Three days later, the Bible tells us that he was resurrected. And in the process of being resurrected, he beat sin and he beat death. And he gives you a lifeline back to God, a father who loves you. And my heart for you today is that you would reach out for that. You may be weary. You may be burdened with your sin. You may be burdened with your past. But today, the Bible says, if you'll reach for the one that can help you, he'll help you. He'll save you for eternity. He'll begin to free you from the bondages that you find yourself in. And he'll begin to set you on the right path. And so if you'd be willing to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God is who he says he is. That he'll do that work. And so right now in the name of Jesus, what I want to do is I want to ask you to respond to the gospel. Would you respond to what Jesus has done for you? So what I'd like you to do on the count of three, as a statement of faith, as a point of saying, yes, I'm in. I'm not hiding anymore. I'm in. Right there in your seat. Nobody's looking around. I want you to do something. If you're online, I want you to do the same thing. You may be in a coffee shop right now, but I want you to do this. On the count of three, I want you to just simply raise your hand up as a way of saying to the world and to God that by faith you believe that he is who he says he is, that he is the son of God, he is the savior of the world, and that you want him to be Lord of your life. And so right now, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Go ahead. In the name of Jesus, I see hands going up all over the room. Come on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Come on, guys. Yes, Jesus. That's what God's doing. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the harvest right here. you to pray this prayer with me. Church, we're all praying this prayer together. Nobody's praying alone. Here's the prayer. Just repeat this. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your son. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That I've messed it up so often. That I've messed it up so often. Would you forgive me of my sins? Forgive me. Will you be my savior today? Will you be my savior today? I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. You take over. You take over. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Free me from sin. Free me from sin. God, would you come and dwell inside of me? This day, I choose this day to follow you. To follow you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we celebrate those hands that were going up all over the room? Hands that are going up right there at some coffee shop or at your house. We're just so proud.